Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started then? Uh, is this, you guys able to hear me? Is this picking it up? Okay, great. So um, I am going to be talking about Bidenomics. So let me just mention as a disclaimer at the outset, obviously uh, what I'm going to be doing is trying to focus this talk and point out some of the things that are unique would be a strong word. Like, so where this phrase comes from, the one I remember was where they called it Reaganomics. And that had to do with like the, you know, the economics behind the supply side revolution in the 1980s. So, you know, to talk about Bidenomics, presumably this is like all oh, the economics of Joe Biden. So let me confess to you of all the presidents that have, you know, been in charge since I've been politically aware, or whatever, I have listened the least to Joe Biden. Um, and I, and it's, just, it's, it, they don't pay me enough, right? It's just too painful. But, uh, it, but let me mention though, so th of course, like it would be obvious, an obvious joke for me to open up with here to say things like, oh, you know, Biden's just a puppet and the, you know, we're going to talk about the economics of the people who are, you know, writing the script for him or whatever. In, a, in the beginning, I thought some of that was overplayed that, you know, people would, would pass clips around on Twitter of, you know, Biden and look at this, this is incomprehensible. And I would play, it's like, yeah, he's an old guy, and I, but I know what he's trying to say. You know, he just kind of went off on a, tr a tangent, or he lost his, his place. And that, in other words, like a lot of the, the examples of look at how deranged or look at how, you know, he's, he's got dementia, I thought, nah. Did you guys see the, what happened last night, the town hall? There were some clips from there that I said, okay, yes, maybe they are right. So, um, so anyway, like what I said, like I say, for this, what, I, what I'm going to be doing is trying to isolate things that are, if not unique, at least like the signature elements of what the Biden administration says it's, a, it's trying to do with respect to the economy. Okay, so just to give you an idea of what we're going to talk about here, he made a big thing, you know, saying after getting through the pandemic, what we're going to focus on is the return to climate change, and there's a lot of the economics in, involved with that. And then unemployment insurance extension, stimulus infrastructure, and this, uh, re earlier this month, he signed this executive order on competition. So with the limited time I have, I'll just try to hit some of the highlights uh, on these areas. Okay, so as far as his climate agenda, some of the things they're doing, he's re-entering the Paris Agreement. So for this talk, I won't dwell on this. There's a separate thing I did for Mises University in a previous year, if you're interested in this stuff. Just so you know, that's like one of my areas of expertise is I spent many years studying the economics of climate change and you know, not just from a, an Austrian perspective, but just in general, really getting into that literature. And so let me just give you a, a, a taste of what I'm talking about here is that this stuff, it's, it's not merely that you would, if you're against the government taxing carbon dioxide emissions or you know, putting regulations on how much insulation buildings need to have and so forth, or the energy efficiency of your microwave in your house. And by the way, all that stuff, the federal government really does have regulations on all those things, all right? So it, it's, it's really incredible just how much of every aspect of your life the federal government thinks now it has the ability or the, the competence and responsibility to intervene in and to dictate to you on because of the threat of man-made climate change. It used to be global warming, now it's climate change. Um, and so that's, when you get into that literature, like I say, it's not merely that, oh, because I'm a libertarian, I'm against this stuff for philosophical reasons, that's why I'm against it. The, own, the literature itself does not support any of this stuff. So I'll give you a couple examples of what I mean in a minute, but it, it was shocking when I really got into this to see the gap between what the peer reviewed research, you know, that's the gold standard or that's the fiat standard that, that they have, you know, for this stuff. Hey, follow the science, don't be a science denier. And then you go in and you read the actual published literature and what you know, policy recommendations they're giving in the name of this stuff. Okay, so anyway, I have, at a previous Mises University, I had a whole thing on the, the economics of the Paris Agreement, something like that. So if you want to Google my name, you can go find more. But what Biden did is re-entered it. And this is something that the Trump administration had done. And I was amazed that, you know, obviously Donald Trump on the campaign trail, you know, for the 2016 election, was talking a good game about free markets and this is crazy and China's eating our lunch and we got to stop, you know, tying our industry's hands behind their back. And then he came in and pulled out of the Paris Agreement. I was uh, amazed that he did something so bold because if, if you're not familiar with it, it, it was just a, a, a huge move. Like, like no other Republican president would have done anything remotely like that. You know, they would have tweaked something and said, hey, instead of cutting back emissions by this amount, let's only cut it back by 2.7% less or something. That, that's what... 
you know, a Republican normally would have done, and he just pulled out of that, so that was amazing. But Biden undid it. Uh, he hosted the Leaders' Summit on Climate uh, back in April. That was the one you may remember where everyone was kind of poking fun of him, that they were all in their separate remote locations videoing in, and Biden had, still had his mask on just to make sure that SARS-CoV-2 didn't go through the Internet and get people. Um, and then he... he canceled a permit that was necessary for the Keystone Pipeline, and then it was just recently that the, the company that you know, runs this thing, you know, it's from Canada to the U.S., finally just gave up on the project because, you know, they'd been suffering years of delays both in the courts and in terms of regulation. The Trump administration had, for its part, ex, you know, moved things along at the federal level, and then so Biden sort of stymied that, and he, you know, that wasn't a surprise. He pledged that he was going to do that in the campaign trail. And so finally, the, you know, the company that was responsible for that go, just said, okay, forget about it. Incidentally, let me just mention, from a libertarian property rights perspective, it, there is a case to be made that this was not a good project, right? That there, you know, there were property owners whose uh, legal rights were being run roughshod over by this company coming in and, and you know, in cahoots with the government and going ahead and building a pipeline. So one could be a Rothbardian and object to this thing, but that's not why Joe Biden held up the permit, right? It's not that he was losing sleep at night over property rights, okay? So, okay, let me now just go on a brief digression just to circle back to what I was mentioning to you before about the, this gap between like what the peer-reviewed li literature says and, and, and this, the climate agenda that Biden is now you know, re-entering. So the Paris Climate Agreement, and by the way, the reason they call it an agreement and not a treaty is because for the US to be able to get into it. If it was a treaty, then the Senate Republicans would have had to endorse it and they could have held it up. And so that's why under the Obama administration, they were clear, let's not call it a treaty, it's, it's an agreement. Um, so this, what they originally said was, we're gonna, all the, the nations of the world that signed this thing are going to do what they can to limit total global warming to 2.0 degrees Celsius or less. And when they say that, they mean cumulative relative to pre-industrial times, like the 1800s, okay? And then, so they, they got everyone on board with that. And then activists, you know, the, the environmentalists started agitating and saying, that's not enough. And they would come up with all these, you know, the, the latest literature shows that it's much worse than we realized. It's, it's every year they realize the problem was what, much worse than they realized. And... Um, so that violates rational expectations, by the way, in case you want to zing the Chicago school. You can just say people have not learned. Um, so they're, they're, they're kept warning, and they said 2.0 degrees Celsius is way too much warming. Look at, you know, the coral reefs would collapse, da, 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 all these huge problems, you know, forest fires, look at this stuff, look, open your eyes. And so then they ratcheted it back and said, really what we ought to do is get, you know, tr try to limit it to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Okay, but you know, then they realize we might not be able to make it, but you know, two is too much. So let, for sure, everyone's got to stay under two degrees Celsius, but let's try to limit total you know, warming from the planet to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Incidentally, just as an aside, th that's the way we're talking here. You know, to say, hey, what do we want global temperatures to be in the year 2100 is incredible hubris, and obviously that's, it's ludicrous, right, just to, to even talk like that. But I'm my point here is to say, even if you go into this literature and accept their basic premises on their own terms, the stuff they're saying is insane. All right, and I, just, and I just want to briefly give you examples of what I mean. So back in 2018, in order to sort of give a stamp of approval to this now growing movement among like the, you know, the more radical activists to, hey, 2.0 degrees Celsius is too much warming, let's now move the goalposts and insist on 1.5 degrees Celsius for the ceiling, on you know how much global warming we're going to tolerate, the UN's um, special body, the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel, Panel on Climate Change, uh, issued this special report. And the, I know like, the PowerPoints is nicer, it's visually appealing if I grab things besides just text. And so I went to get the cover of this report, thinking it would be this flashy thing. This is the cover of the report, as far as I could tell. Right. So this is very, very boring. They pass the savings on to you, is my understanding. <laughs> but so this was a report in 2018 called it was it's, you know, special report colon global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius. Now they were very slick about it. Nowhere in the report does it actually say 
the benefits of doing, of pursuing this goal would be higher than the costs, right? They don't actually say this would be a good idea. They, 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 and I'm not, I don't just mean it's merely an error of omission. I mean, they explicitly have sections explaining this distinction and saying, you know, there's a literature out there talking about, you know, weighing the benefits and costs of doing policies. That's not what we're doing here. All right, they're just, they're just taking it saying scientists have told us we need to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So here's policies governments of the world could pursue to that end, right? That, so they're being very agnostic. And the reason they're doing that is because there's no way using any possible framework that you could justify this stuff using conventional literature. So I don't mean, according to the Heritage Foundation or the Cato Institute, I'm saying the standard peer-reviewed stuff in mainstream economics of climate change journals there's no way that this makes any sense. This is a crazy draconian goal. And so let me just explain, give you an example of what I mean. The same weekend that this was published in 2018, William Nordhaus won the Nobel Prize in economics for his work on the economics of climate change. Now Nordhaus is not a Rothbardian. He uh, is a Keynesian. He was a co-author in later editions with Paul Samuelson on his famous best-selling economics textbook. So Nordhaus is a Keynesian guy. He's big on government intervention. The point of him getting into the economics of climate change literature was to tell governments it's a huge market failure. Humanity could you know, spare itself trillions of dollars in needless damages if we had an optimal carbon tax. Okay, So that's who this guy is. He's not an ideologue from the right by any stretch. And his model that he won the Nobel Prize for in 2018 showed in terms of the latest numbers that he ran, it was a 26, 2016 calibration, it showed that, oh, if, hum if humanity does nothing, the globe's gonna warm about four degrees Celsius. If we do what Nordhaus's model said it would be the optimal carbon tax, it would warm about 3.5 degrees Celsius. And then, as just a, as a benchmark, he said, suppose we limited warming to 2.5 degrees Celsius, he said that would be so bad, that would hurt the global economy so much and cause so much economic damage from you know, higher energy prices and so on to hit, to hit that target or that constraint, that it would more than swamp the additional reduction in you know, environmental damages from climate change. And it would be so bad that just trying to limit warming to 2.5 C would be worse for humanity than if governments did nothing at all. Right, so that's what the Nobel Prize winner said in 2018. So if limiting warming just to 2.5 C would be worse than doing nothing about climate change, 1.5 C would be even worse than doing that, right? That, that was so draconian, he didn't even bother putting that in his model at that point, because he thought that's just crazy, that's a ridiculous policy. So th th that's what I'm getting at here. And because he won the Nobel the same weekend that this report came out, places like the New York Times treated them as if they were complimentary. And so readers are like, oh, yep, the writing's on the wall, you know, all these different, the, it's the physical sciences, the economists, everybody knows how bad climate change is. And Nordhaus himself in interviews was real coy about it. Someone said, can we still hit the 1.5 C target? And he just said, uh, at this point, I think that's too late. He didn't say, and thank goodness, because that's a stupid idea. He just, he kept that to himself because he just won the Nobel Prize and wanted to bask, you know, in, in the righteousness. So th that's, that's an example of what I mean, where it's not just that, oh, that policy is not quite optimal. It's that the guy who just won the Nobel, his work says this policy is so incredibly stupid that it would be better for humanity just to ignore climate change than do that. And yet they're, we're getting lectured about, you know, follow the science. Um, one other quick one. The UN's IPCC, its body on climate change, periodically issues reviews that distill down the state of the art of the literature, both you know, in the physical science and the economics of climate change literature, just to give a guide to policymakers. So they came out with one in 2014. It was the fifth such thing in that series. And its conclusions were very tepid, you know, vis-a-vis -vis this kind of a target, right? So as of 2014, the UN was not supporting anything in the same ballpark as this aggressive goal. So then you're saying, oh, so by 2018, it's funny that they completely reversed themselves and now did this. I guess all the experts must have changed their mind. No, here's what they did. If you look at, and this is something that my co-author Ross McKittrick noticed, all right, so this isn't my point, but this is amazing when you, when you get, if you get what I'm saying. In 2014, they had about 60, don't quote me on that, but it's about 60 different, uh, you know, economist experts in this area on their panels to go ahead and review the literature and then, you know, report their findings. And they have like a lead author for the chapter and then the consulting editors and you know things like that people who just do particular sections so that's how these things work when they come up with these huge compilations so in 2014 they had like 60 people 
contributing, and they said, here's the state of the art of the science. Didn't come anywhere close to supporting something this crazy. 2018, they come out with a report be very coyly leading you to believe this is a good idea. And they, again, had dozens of experts for this new one. Of those two groups of people, the people that back in 2014, the UN said, these are the experts on climate change in terms of the economic policies. Let's see what they have to say about the literature. Four years later, this comes out, the, you know, the recommendation or the implicit recommendation flips completely. Of those two groups of experts, there was only one person who was in both groups. So they completely changed who the experts on the literature were in four years, all right? And so that's partly how, so to be clear, the people for this one, they all had PhDs in you know, the appropriate area. So they, they weren't just the guy off the street, but the point is they were a different group of people from who four years earlier had been anointed to be the ones to summarize the literature. So that's part of the, the tricks that they use. Okay, uh, switching gears now back to what the Biden administration is doing. So unemployment insurance, let me just summarize some of the big picture and then we'll talk about the economics of it. So typically in the United States, this is handled at the state level. So what happens is if you have a job, part of what you know, the employer on your behalf is paying into the unemployment insurance fund, and then if you get laid off, you can apply for unemployment insurance, it's called, Hans Hoppe would not like using the term insurance here, but that's what they call it. And so, you know, you, oh, I don't have a job right now, I'm looking for work, and then you get checks from the government to help you get by, and they justify that both on, you know, humanitarian reasons, but also, oh, we don't want aggregate demand to plummet when people get laid off, we want them to keep, you know, being able to spend, so, right? So that's the justification, and that's typically handled at the state level in the U.S., and it's typically a fraction of what you were earning when you were employed, right? So every worker's, if you get laid off and you're getting unemployment checks from the government, you're not getting, for one thing, the check's different. So how much you earned when you were employed affects how much the government sends you, the way these things are, you know, have been run historically. And there's a, there's a finite time, right? You can't just keep doing that forever and be unemployed for 10 years. At some point, they cut you off. Okay, so that all, and the, and the fraction was like, 50, 65%, something like in that range. Okay, so that's how that thing was typically run. When the pandemic hit, they passed in March of 2020, the so-called CARES Act, right? They always gotta come up with these acronyms uh, that mean the opposite of what they're doing. And what that did, and I'll, you'll see in a minute here why this is particularly uh, alarming or, or, or why this had such a drastic impact possibly on labor supply, is in the CARE Act, the federal government came in and said, we're going to supplement what the states are paying to people, right? And, and partly, and I saw some libertarians justifying this, and, you know, there's, there's a case to be made that, well, wait a minute, if the government at various levels is literally preventing you from going to work, right, because they're making you stay in home, that they're saying your business is non-essential, and so if the government's using its force to stop you from going to work and earning a living, well, then, yes, they need to compensate you, right, just like in the real world right now, if the government says, we got to build a highway where your house is, get out, and then they compensate you, there's a case to be made that you, know, you shouldn't view that as you getting stolen money from taxpayers, that, hey, the government took my property without my consent, and at least they're compensating, all right? So I'm not weighing in one side or the other here, but I, I am just saying, I, some people could plausibly argue that if the government's not letting you go to work, maybe they should give you some money as compensation. Okay, whatever the rationale, whatever you think about it in terms of the principles, this is what they did. And the way they structured it, though, was, so the states are still doing what they're doing, and then the federal government was just giving everybody, regardless of how much they made when they were employed, a flat $600 per week supplement for unemployment insurance, what they were calling unemployment insurance, if you, were, you, know, if you didn't have your job during the, the pandemic. All right, and then that originally was gonna be through July 2020, and then that ended up expiring back in December of 2020, Congress came in and reauthorized it at, at you know, $300 a week. And then the Biden administration went ahead and extended that through, I think the latest right now is September of this, this year, 2021. Okay, so, uh, and this is the one where, I think it was the, this context, you might've seen that quote where, where Biden, like he's whispering and he leans forward, he's looking at me and goes, this is good, it helps people, puts money in the economy, doesn't hurt anybody. Right, and I saw someone retweet that and said me trying to justify a 3 a.m. Taco Bell run. But, <laughs> so th that's, you know, so that's where they're coming from with this. So now the, the concern is, you know, what, why, why would this be controversial? So here is, for people in the back, let me do, that's uh, labor force participation rate. 
Okay, and you can see here that there's a huge drop off going into the panics. This is 2020, right? So a huge drop off. And then it did bounce back a little bit. Oops. It did bounce back a little bit, but obviously not fully recovered. Be before I continue on this in terms of the economics, let's just do a quick how to, how to mislead with statistics. Let me just draw your attention to this axis over here. You see that number? That's not zero, right? So that drop looks bigger than it really is, right? And so just so you know, I didn't calibrate that. This is just what Fred, the St. Louis Federal Reserve's website automatically does. So don't, you can't trust the Federal Reserve is what I'm getting at. But <laughs> in case you're not getting my point is looking at this, it looks like the labor force participation rate fell off like 30%. And I'm saying if you look at the axis, it's, it's not that big. It's, you know, they, they uh, do a snapshot around the chart. But in any event, that's still, you can tell, a, a big drop. And then yes, it did recover, but not, you know, it made up about half the ground. Okay, and anecdotally, I'm sure many of you have noticed, especially for like restaurants and things like that, where they they have signs up often saying, I've I've seen this in different states and whatever, saying, please be patient with us. We our, our work we can't get workers. We're training new people. You know that that's why your order is going to be all screwed up. Is, is words they're basically saying. All right. So number one, if you have never been employed before hurry up and do it before September. Now is the easiest time if you're in the United States for you, if you're a young person, to get a job because the people who used to work in those areas right now are still getting paid by the government to not work. And so, you know, they're weighing the, the costs and benefits and when you're getting paid, that's another reason to delay coming back to the, into the labor force. So the critics of this extension of the unemployment insurance are saying, what do you think's gonna happen? The government's in many cases literally paying people more to not go into work than they would get if they started going to work, right? Because once you take a job, then you lose the, 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 these benefits, all right? So that's the argument. And Biden, of course, was, was saying, no, 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 the fact that the job numbers, that, we, that they, were, they weren't as impressive in April, that's when this was like a, a hot topic and, and this controversy came up again. He was saying, oh, the fact that you know, the job numbers went, yeah, it was disappointing, the report, but we are hiring more people. There's more people hired now than there were you know, three months ago. The economy's improving. And so, and so that's why this is a good idea, right? It's, it's not that we're paying people to stay home. And even Janet Yellen came out. Now, as an economist, she had to be a little uh, more coy about it. And so she just said something like, well, I don't think the fact that we're, you know, the, the higher compensation for un in terms of unemployment checks is the reason that the labor force participation rate is remaining low that it's, you know, because people are still scared about coronavirus and things like that, right? Some of these industries are supply chain problems. So she wasn't denying that, yes, other things equal. If you give people higher unemployment benefits, they're going to be slower to return to work, right? They would be hard as an economist to say that. I mean, that's like in Krugman's textbook, that's standard stuff. If you pay people for something, you're going to get more of that outcome. So if you're giving people more money, if they're unemployed, don't be surprised if on the margin, more people choose to remain in that status. But she was just saying, that's probably not what's driving you know, this, this lag, this, this reluctance of people to come back into the labor force. That, that's what her argument was. So I won't dwell too long here on the, so it, it's arguably empirical, right? That yes, a priori, clearly paying people more higher unemployment is going to be one factor, but there could be other things swamping it. So that's what the argument is. So I went in just to look at this literature. So I don't, I don't need to summarize, you know, the, the, pro, the people arguing, bumping up the numbers, prolonged unemployment, because that's pretty obvious. What I'm going to show you here is how you can use, like, the critics to even use their own work just to show, right? So sort of a fun little exercise. So here... The screenshot, I'm just showing you the, the, where I'm getting this from. So it's from the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. Just the fact that it's the Washington Center for Equitable Growth tells you most of what you need to know about where these people are coming from. And, um, and, and then it says, uh, the long-run implications of extending unemployment benefits in the United States for workers, firms, and the economy. And this came out in December of 2020. All right, so one... The whole report, it's, it's very glowing. This is very much in support of the federal government supplementing the states with unemployment benefits. And it has all kinds of charts like this. So I'll, I'll just read some of these key things. So the title here says, when workers have access to a longer duration of unemployment insurance benefits, reemployment wages increase. And then the, 
the bottom here, it's showing different how, how long the unemployment benefits were in place for. Because like I said, you know, historically, you'd get cut off after a certain time, and then with each new economic calamity, it certainly go for the, what was called the Great Recession, be, to, to be more generous and to not be so heartless and cruel in the face of these horrible economic times, Congress would keep extending the benefits, right? Because no one wants to vote to cut off unemployment insurance when the unemployment rate's really high. That, this is terrible politically, the optics of it, right? And so what these people who are for such policies are trying to show is, look, as you extend how long the government pays people unemployment benefits when they're out of work and still technically looking for a job, um, once they finally do get rehired, the wage they get tends to go up. Right, so if, if they just have 26 weeks, you see that the wage increase relative to before they got laid off is a little bump. 72 weeks, 79 weeks was the maximum benefit length in 2009. And then what happened um, in 2010 and 2011 was, it was up to 99 weeks. If you just do the numbers, like there's only 52 weeks in a year, that's a long time to be getting checks from the government while you're looking for work, right? And so you see how that just keeps going up. And they talk here in the bottom about how it's, it's a matching problem, right? You're unemployed, you're looking for work, employers are out there, they need workers, and they're searching for each other. They're just trying to find each other. You can play some romantic music. And then once a match is made, then you get hired. And so their point is, if we expand the length of time for which we're willing to pay workers during the search process, ultimately when the match is made, they're gonna have a higher pay. So my, what I'm saying to you is, th notice this is entirely consistent with the story that increasing the length of how long you pay, the, you know, the benefits that you're paying them will make them stay unemployed longer, right? That's why they can find a better match is because, and, and get higher pay once they do get hired again, is because they have longer to look, okay? So I'm, I'm saying this whole study, nothing in it contradicted the, what the critics were saying, even though the authors of this study were putting it out as if, this is to rebut those critics that say, you know, gen overly generous federal unemployment benefits during the, the pandemic are somehow, you know, hurting the labor force. No, 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 actually, look at the longer we, so this isn't about the, the size of the payment. This particular study was looking at the, the duration, but saying if we have a longer duration, workers end up making more. So how could you possibly say this hurts labor? So do you see what they're doing there? So it, again, this is entirely consistent, right? The, the mechanism by which this comes true is that people stay unemployed longer and spend longer, a longer time looking for a job that pays more. Or thinking of it the other way, in order to get you to stop taking checks from the government, which are more than you were making before, you need to find a job. You have to wait until you get a job offer where you're getting a huge raise, right? That's the only thing that would induce you to stop getting checks for doing nothing, okay? So that's another way of looking at it. But my point is, even this, website or this study that was for the policy is actually totally consistent with what the critics were saying. I found another one. So I was, I Googled, you know, news stories looking for unemployment insurance restricts labor supply or, or reduces labor. And the author, I think it, it was, it was like, it was Vox.com. I'm almost positive, right? So they were you know, d d wagging their fingers at this, this notion, oh, they don't listen to these right-wingers. And they said, after all, a study from the summer of 2020, when the CARES Act first kicked in, showed that it didn't have a, an impact, it didn't reduce labor supply. And so, we, again, you, you see that huge drop in the labor force participation rate in people like Janet Yellen just arguing, well, it could have been due to lots of factors, we don't know. But now this one's saying, no, no, empirically, they went and looked and showed that it didn't, it, it wasn't because of, I was just curious, well, how did, what was the argument? So let me just show you. Before I do that, though, let me just pause and make sure you understand the numbers involved here, because probably you have common sense, that's why you're here in Auburn, and you assume other, you know, your understanding of how ridiculous some of these payments were compared to what the worker was making, you might have thought, well, I'm sure it wasn't that unreasonable. No, oh, wait a minute. So here, this is from their table. I just wanna make sure you understand how this thing worked and why, remember I said 10 minutes ago, the flat $600 payment from the federal government, regardless of what you made, why that was so severe for particular workers. So $300 weekly earnings. So these two columns are saying, let's take a, a typical worker. So somebody who was making, when they were employed, $300 a week, pre-cares, meaning before this March 2020 federal 
package came in, like the way it was traditionally handled at the state level. In California, for example, your unemployment compensation for the, you know, the time that it would be enforced would be $150 a week, right? So there, that was 50%. So again, if you had been a worker who made on average $300 a week when you were employed, you get laid off, the California government administering its unemployment compensation plan would give you about 150 a week. So after the CARES Act kicks in in March 2020, you're now getting on top of that an extra 600 a week. So they're saying you're getting total 750 a week and notice the percent change going from 150 to 750 is a 400% increase, right? So that's what those percentage changes are referring to saying, what's your compensation, your unemployment compensation pre CARES Act and post. And so for different workers, that jump is a different percentage, right? That's, that's what they're trying to get at here. So it, it wasn't treating all workers the same or didn't impact all the workers the same. In Oregon, uh, as opposed to, or in contrast, you got 195. So you can see they gave you more than 50%, but not that much more, right? So typically you'd get about 195. So that increased to 795. That's only a 307% increase. Okay, so what they're doing here is they're establishing there's variation in the data, right? So if you're gonna do an econometric study, it can't just be everyone gets the same treatment and then you go and look at the outcome because there could have been other things going on. Ideally, what you want is people get different sizes of the dose of the thing that you're looking at, the treatment, to then see what, you know, how does the outcome change so you can kind of get some variation. So that's what they're doing here is they're showing, look at our data has lots of variation in the um, independent variable. What about people making $600 a week, right? Because different workers made different amounts of money. For someone who typically made $600 a week when employed, in California, the pre-CARES payment would be $300, right, 50%. You add $600 to that, so now it's $900, so that's a 200% increase. And then, but in Oregon, it would be $390 to $990, so that's a 154%. Okay, so you see how these numbers are coming, where they're coming from, but two things. One is they're different for different workers, but two, you see why that flat $600 payment is so enormous because for particular workers, look at the, the impact it would have had. And that's what I mean when I'm saying lots of workers, this wasn't a right-wing exaggeration. There were plenty of people, millions, who were truly getting paid more to stay home than if they went back and took a job. So of course, they would be crazy to, for them to take a job uh, just you know, in terms of the narrow cost benefit. Beyond that, if you go and look at some of the discussion about when they came up, like how did they come up with the $600 figure? They did it quite consciously to replace the median workers' wages, right? So they, were, they, they wanted it to be that workers were getting paid at least as much as they were before the pandemic hit. Because why? They wanted them to stay home, right? And, and they made no bones about it. They're, they were saying, yeah, we don't want people to have to choose between limiting the spread of coronavirus and putting food on the table. So that's why we need it to be that they can't just get 50 or 65% of what they used to make. That's not enough to make ends meet. If we were telling them to stay home for three months, we got to bump it up, right? So it's ironic that now after it did what it was designed to do, people are scratching their heads and saying, why are these right wingers saying this had anything to do with labor supply, right? That, that was the, the ostensible rationale for it. Sort of like with the housing bubble stuff, when people when right-wing types later were saying, well, the government was trying to encourage loans to people who wouldn't have qualified otherwise, and so maybe that's partly why some people got into houses they shouldn't have, and then the critics were, what are you talking about? You're just making this stuff. Back when it was working, that was the whole rationale of the program. They were saying, we can't just let free market lending rule the day because not enough people get loans. We need the government to come in. And then when it blows up, all of a sudden, they're denying that that was the rationale. So a similar thing here. But let's go back to that pay pressure. So these are some of their results. I'll just walk through this one slide. I know it's in the back, it might be hard to see. So they're looking at an event study, the effects of the replacement rate ratio on the probability of employment. So what they're trying to do is empirically assess, looking at, you know, because they, they had vast amounts of data in terms of, you know, the um, surveys and stuff that the federal government collects to see, given what that, what those ratios were, just to remind you, like the 400%, the 307, the 200, those numbers, that's what they're looking at. They're looking at how much were you getting from the state before the CARES Act and then after, and then they're gonna group workers by those percentages and look and see, do we see any difference in the employment probability of that group of workers, you know, based on if we segregate them and group them according to how much did their unemployment go up when they started getting the 600 a week, flat payment from the feds. And lo and behold, it does look like there's a big difference. And it works out exactly as one would have guessed. 
So that bottom line, that red one, is 5.0 or greater, right? So they're saying the ratio, if, if the amount of unemployment compensation you got is 500%, well, 400% greater, five times as much, then the probability of you being employed like as of May 2020, right, a few, a few months after this thing kicked in, this is 30, so it's like a negative 34%, right? So there's a 34% percent chance less that you're going to be employed when they checked in May of 2020 if the amount you were getting paid was five times more than it normally would have been. But the, and then the green line you can see is between four and five. So those colors line up exactly as you would expect. And again, it's not like a little effect. You can see, so this time the axis isn't misleading. That, that, that is the right axis. That's zero up there where they all are together. And notice before the pandemic, those lines were all very close together, right? And all of a sudden, the pandemic hits, the CARES Act kicks in at the dotted line, and you see all of a sudden this huge dispersal, dispersion, I guess is the word I want, and it lines up exactly as you would expect. The people who got paid more compared to beforehand are much less likely now to have a job if we check in in, in May, for example. And so again, on its own terms, doesn't this confirm exactly what the critics are saying? Like, how is this an argument against it? Why is the Vox writer saying a study in July of 2020 showed the CARES Act had a negligible impact on employment probability. This is what the argument of the authors say. They're saying, yeah, it's true, looking at past that dotted line, but if you look at before the dotted line to after the dotted line, it doesn't look like anything big changed, right? So they're looking at this. They're not looking at this gap or that gap. They're looking at the gap here compared to the gap there. You see that? And so they're saying, looking at this chart, I don't see why that dotted line has anything to do with it. You, you, so that's the argument they're making, and I'm just pointing out to you that the, you know, the, the raw data is entirely consistent with the story. They're arguing that, well, no, it must have been something else that caused it because the CARES Act, those $600 checks, didn't actually start coming in until the dotted line. So whatever it is that made those groupings spread out like that must have been something else. I got to move on here to hit the other points. Let me just anticipate an obvious response from somebody who believes in incentives and the fact that people respond rationally to getting paid more to stay home is to say, okay, well, people knew this was coming, right? So the fact that, they, and this timeline is very narrow, by the way, that's like a one week difference going from those two data points. So to say, because you start seeing the impact of the CARES Act a week before the checks start rolling in, doesn't mean it didn't influence people's decisions, right? Especially in the midst of a, you know, they're being told that this thing is gonna kill everybody. Why don't you stay home? And the authors try to go through and show, well, if you look at congressional testimony, it wasn't obvious how big the you know, payment was gonna be. And so we don't think that you know, the anticipation has anything to do with it. All right, so that's, that's, they do try to deal with that. But in any event, this is what the outcome shows. Okay, stimulus infrastructure. This was, has become sort of a running joke where members of the Biden administration are trying to argue that just about anything is quote infrastructure, because again, that's for whatever reason, the public is okay with that. Spending money on infrastructure, they're thinking, yeah, the roads are terrible, that bridge is gonna collapse on me. Given the government's gonna spend a bunch of money, I'd rather they spend it on that than boondoggle projects. And so it was sort of a running joke where, like I say, Biden officials were arguing that all sorts of stuff was, was infrastructure when it, when it clearly wasn't. But even on its own terms, this is from the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office's latest long-term budget outlook. And this is the federal, US federal debt as a share of the, the economy. And you can see where we are right now. It's not quite, but it's almost as high as it was at the peak level during World War II. And then it just keeps going. And that is not because the people at the CBO forecast a huge recession because they believe in Austrian business cycle theory. This is just on autopilot. This is what's baked into the cake because of demographic trends with Medicare and Medicaid you know, the aging of the population, what's sometimes called unfunded liabilities, if you're familiar with the term, and as they forecast that interest rates go from rock bottom levels up a few points back to more historic norms, right? So they're, they're not predicting a huge, you know, uh, a spike in interest rates because the bond market flips on the U.S. and, and they crash the dollar. That, that's not what it, it's just, well, interest rates right now are historic lows, they're going to start inching up over the next couple decades, and given the outstanding federal debt, if interest rates go from you know, 1.5% to 3%, that's gonna have a huge impact on the cost of servicing it. It's that sort of thing that is driving that. 
Okay, so this, this idea that the federal government has not been spending money on, on bridges and roads and that's why we, everything's in disrepair is crazy. And also just to say, oh, what we really need to, to get out of this and to rec have the economy recover is just more federal spending, in, in particular deficit spending, you can see that that's, these numbers don't add up. That the way things are right now, they're spending way more than they should. And especially as unemployment officially drops, you would think they would be you know, forecasting surpluses. Okay, now that we're emerging from this, let's go ahead and flip to start paying down some of that, but that, that's not what they're doing. Okay, last thing I'll mention here is this executive order on competition. So I think it was earlier this month that Biden actually signed, they had been talking about it for a while. There's one good element of this. So it's occupational licensing reform. Now, when I say good element, what I mean is in principle, you know, this could be a good thing. They could, they could take it and, and do something good with it. They are at least acknowledging, you know, the language in there is very watered down, but they're saying things like uh, occupational licensing, just to make sure I'm not losing anybody. What that means is it's often handled at the state level, but there's also ways that the federal government gets involved with it. It's saying that if you want to be able to work in a certain occupation, you need to get a license from the government first. Okay, so the, the way to, to justify, you know, to a normal person, who doesn't trust the free market and you know, thinks businesses are out to get you and they think that the government's there to protect you, the way they would understand this and historically what this was supposed to be would be things like, oh yeah, if you wanna become a, a, a brain surgeon, you can't just put up a shingle and you know, cl clean off your, your pool table and maybe put a tarp down or something for sanitary reasons and, uh, and then just start operating on people. You, you need to have a license from, you know, from the government, typically state level, right? The, the state medical board has to license you. It, it's illegal for you to practice medicine or for you to practice law is another good example, right? You need to have passed the bar. You need to have a law license. Law to, and, and then how do you get that? Oh, you got to go to law school. How do you get a medical uh, you know, a license to be a brain surgeon? Well, you got to go to medical school, right? So it, there's a I would say collusion, you could just say an affinity or an interaction and cooperation, if you want to use less loaded language, between academia and the government regulators on this stuff. And the, again, the ostensible rationale to the, from the public's perspective is to weed out charlatans, right? To make sure only qualified people are in these very sensitive areas, particularly things where it would be hard for the consumer before buying the product or service to judge. And then if it, if it goes poorly, you know, you can't just say, well, I'm never going back to that guy to operate on my brain. You know, that didn't work out so well. Now I have 16 lobes, right? So that's, they're saying, that's different from, oh, I went, you know, I, I bought a, I don't, I'm trying to think of something innocuous. I, I went to take my dog to get, you know, groomed and the person did a bad job and, and I'm, I could, my dog looks goofy for two months until the, the fur grows back. Like th that, that's pretty innocuous. And yet dog groomers in certain jurisdictions do need to get licensed, right? So there's, my point is there, there have been such ridiculous over-the-top over horror stories of this stuff that are absurd that even normal people who are normally don't trust the market and are okay with governments coming in and regulating can see that, wait a minute, this isn't about protecting the public. This is just about the entrenched producers in an industry limiting competition from newcomers. And it's, it's quite explicit. Like, this is obviously what happens because given that there's you know, a board to say like, okay, in this jurisdiction, how many new people can open a hair salon? Who should get a license to be able to become a hairdresser, like to do African braiding, for example. And so who are the experts on that? The people right now who are doing that for a living. They're the, they're the experts. They're the ones already in there. And they get to decide what the optimal number of, of new entrants to allow into the community is. So you can see how that's a very um, dangerous system and liable to corruption where they're going to say, oh, in the interest of the public, I think we got to be, you know, raise our standards to make sure that the hairdressers in this area are impeccable. And naturally that raises wages in that industry. So like I say, there is some language, if you go and read this executive order that Biden signed earlier this month about, yes, while it does protect the public in certain things in some areas, it's perhaps overzealous and da, da, da. And so we're going to, you know, use the tools of the federal government to pull back. So like I say, that at least there's a nod to something that somewhat makes sense. But a lot of the rest of it is it, just completely wrongheaded. Um, let me mention, I, I don't know if you guys covered it in terms of the standard curriculum, in terms of you know, what you did this week. I, I looked through the lectures. I don't see something jumping out at me. But certainly in previous Mises U's, there have been lectures on like antitrust enforcement. And so if you go and look at that, the Austrian school is very good 
on competition and how the mainstream gets it wrong. And so in particular, the, the, the metric of, well, how many firms are in an industry, that is a misleading statistic, right? It'd be much better to have one or two big firms controlling 95% of the market so long as there was free and open competition and any upstart could come in and challenge them as opposed to 20 firms splitting the market 5% each, but the government makes it illegal for anyone to come in and compete with them. Okay, and so the Austrians are very good about that. And thank you for your time.